One of the things that I love about my pops, my dad, is his sense of humor. Uh, when I was younger, I remember him pranking me all the time, and I get scared really easily. I'm super jumpy. He knew that, and so he would scare me all the time, and he would just stand there and laugh at me while I tried to regain my composure. This happened all throughout my childhood. You know, he would do things like open the door to the bathroom while I was showering. You know, it'd be loud enough for me to hear, so I'd pop my head out of the shower curtain, and he would have two massive cups full of water, and he would slowly inch his way towards the shower while I would scream in anticipation of this frigid Arctic water to be dumped on me, and he would dump it on me and just stand there and laugh at me. He would hide fake cockroaches in my sheets and he'd be standing right outside my door ready to bust in when I screamed. And, and when I yelled or something, he would just come through the door and stand there and he would, he would think it was so funny. And one of my favorite pranks of all times, I was probably about 17, he used to get on to me about my car being so dirty. Like, just like my car was filthy. I had random junk piled up in the back seats. And half of the stuff, I had no idea where, how he even got there. You know, it was like... Who's, whose cat is this? Why is a cat in my car? I guess he got tired of uh, telling me to clean out my car, so he, he thought he'd teach me a lesson. Now that summer, for some reason, Japanese beetles were really bad, so, so Pops was putting these things called bag-o-bugs in his pine trees to prevent those beetles from eating him or hurting him. And he took one of those bags and he jammed it under the driver's side seat. And, and I don't know what's in those bags, but man, it was gnarly. It stunk so bad. And the summer heat beating down on my car just made the smell all the worst. I rode around for two weeks with this funky, chunky odor spewing out of my car until I finally cleaned it out and found what he had done. What a great dad, right? And fortunately, I take after my pops and finding pleasure in pranking innocent people. So when I was the campus minister at Merge, the United Methodist Wesley Foundation's campus ministry at Illinois State University, I, I took full advantage of, of this quality of pranking students. And my wife was actually my boss. She's the director there, and so I pranked her all the time. But, but she saw it coming. The students, not so much. Our office had these big windows where we watched college students walk by all day. And if I saw a merge student walking towards the door, I'd go stand by the entrance. When they'd walk in, I'd pop out and scream, and, and they would scream. And, and man, they loved me, I'm telling you. They, they loved that. College students, they're so dramatic in the first place, so it was extra funny when they freaked out on me for scaring them. One student in particular, though, Katie, she used to get so mad when I'd scare her. And so naturally, she was my main target. You know, Katie and Roxy, they'd be standing around chatting, and I'd sneak up behind Katie and just kind of stand there creepily. And Roxy wouldn't bat an eye. She never let on that I was there. And when Katie would turn around, she would just let out this high-pitched shriek. And I'm talking like Mariah Carey-type levels. And I would just stand there and laugh like my pops always did to me. And after a while, anytime I'd scare Katie, you know, she would yell at me and be like, Why? Why do you always do this? And I would get really serious and respond with, well, Katie, after the resurrection, Jesus randomly appeared to his disciples out of nowhere and it surprised them, sometimes scared them. So I'm just trying to live out the resurrection. Now, of course, she knew I was joking every single time I said that to her, and it kind of became this ongoing joke with the students. Oh, he's just living out the resurrection. But, but that's a good question. Like, what does it actually look like to live resurrection lives? The message of Resurrection Sunday, as we all know, is, is about that the Lord is risen. Now, many folks believe that the gospel stories of Jesus' resurrection are historically true, that these factually events, that, that they literally happen. And others have difficulty believing that they are factually or scientifically true, but they understand these stories as metaphors that point to something greater, a greater truth. Both beliefs are actually welcomed here, and they are affirmed here because there's merit to both. But wherever you land on this spectrum, a good question to ask ourselves is, what does resurrection mean in our lives today? Well, let's go ahead and read our scripture for today, coming from John 20, verses 1 through 18. And it says this, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. 
The two were running uh, together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw, and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. But she had, but when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. First and foremost, to all my sisters, you are the first witnesses of Jesus. You are the first evangelizers. You are some of the first church planters. Yes, women, power to you. Women are the future. I love that Mary Magdalene was the first person in the Gospel of John to experience the resurrected Christ. Uh, there's a common misconception about Mary in the Bible that she was a prostitute. This is actually found nowhere in the Bible and is completely inaccurate. But even if it were true, which it's not, it would go along with the ethos of Jesus using the marginalized to further his mission of ushering in a kingdom filled with love and grace. Because Jesus doesn't choose the religious elite to show the world who God is, does he? Jesus uses the broken, the sinful, the forgotten, the most vulnerable, the oppressed, those who the church looks at and deems unworthy. Do you want to see the face of Christ? Look at the ones who's unfairly categorized as the least of these in our society. That's where you'll find resurrection, because resurrection is oftentimes in places we are all unaware of. Now, in the book of John, a major theological theme that shows up time and again is this concept of new creation. It's this idea that with Jesus, all things in your life can be made new and redeemed. Things like the stories that we tell ourselves about our own worth and value, they can turn into a a new narrative where we begin to see our humanity the way the divine sees us, new creation. The ways in which we treat those who are different than us is embodied with a new life as we view others through the lens of Christ's resurrection, new life. The Apostle Paul understood this to be true for the first Christians as he said, whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come, which is exactly what Mary experienced in her encounter with the resurrected Jesus. I love verses 14 and 15 from this text. It says that when Mary saw Jesus, she mistook him for the gardener, which seems so random. Like, why would the person writing this gospel put that in there? You know, what's that all about? Why is that so important for us to know? Well, for the past two months, we've been going through this gospel of John and looking at the seven signs or miracles performed by Jesus. John begins his book with, anyone? Yeah, in the beginning, which for any good Jew would have reverted their attention back to the first creation poem in Genesis 1. This poem begins with, in the beginning when God created. So, so what's going on here? Why is John linking his book with Genesis? You know, in Genesis 1, God takes the chaos and the disorder which already existed. It's this Hebrew word, tohu wa bohu. And, and God creates life and peace and wholeness out of that chaos. The Jews of Jesus' time, they were longing for the day when God would reconcile everything back to God's self. I mean, the relationships between human and God and human and human, human to earth. This idea would have been the restoration of, of all things. It's new creation. 
rebirth, life in the fullest, right here and right now. Not later, you know, not after we die. Not someplace we call heaven that we go to post-mortem, but heaven on earth. The author of this gospel is, is playing on the theological premise of creation by using the garden as a symbol of new life. Now, Jesus mistaking for the gardener, being mistaken for the gardener, is in charge of bringing new life in the midst of his chaos and their chaos, much like God did in Genesis 1. How cool is that connection? I love this stuff. Jesus, in the book of John, in the midst of chaos, becomes a creator with God. Now, we read these creation poems in the book of Genesis, which was written right around 586 BCE. Then, over 600 years later, when the Gospel of John was written, the author believes it's vitally important to begin and end his book with the theme of creation. Are we seeing how important this is? And now, 2,000 years later, we as a people of God are continually being called to live into Jesus' example to be co-creators with the divine. The church has been charged to create and participate in resurrection And so we ask, what is the new creation we need to create? What is God calling us individually and collectively to? How are we as followers of Jesus to become co-creators, emulating the life Jesus lived? Author and theologian Peter Rollins, he says, What we really believe, the true belief, the heart of our belief, is not in what we say, rather it's found in the texture of our lives. Interesting quote, found in the texture of our lives. To believe in the historicity of the resurrection is one thing, but to experience the liveliness of the resurrection is something quite different. The texture of our lives relates to the actions of our lives. The actions of our lives is how we are co-creators. Co-creating is affirming the resurrection of Christ. So if you say that you believe in or affirm the resurrection, can resurrection still exist if you don't live resurrection out as a co-creator with God? Peter Rollins, who I just mentioned a moment ago, he was speaking at a Christian gathering and he was taking um, questions from the audience and someone in the crowd asked him if he denied the resurrection. Now, this person asking the question meant this in a literal sense, that Jesus literally rose from the grave, that kind of resurrection. And this is what Peter Rowland said. He said, I deny the resurrection of Christ every time I do not serve at the feet of the oppressed, each day that I turn my back on the poor. I deny the resurrection of Christ when I close my eyes to the cries of the downtrodden and the oppressed. Every time I do not serve my neighbor, every time I walk away from the poor, I deny the resurrection every time I participate in an unjust system. However, there are moments when I affirm the resurrection, few and far between as they are. I affirm the resurrection when I stand up for those who are forced to live on their knees. I affirm the resurrection when I speak for those who have had their tongues torn out. I affirm the resurrection when I cry for those who have no more tears left to shed. I affirm the resurrection each and every time I look into your eyes and see the face of Christ. So what are you doing today that denies the resurrection? What are you doing today that affirms the resurrection? The way we participate in resurrection is to co-create with God. We co-create with God by serving someone who we know is in need. We affirm the resurrection by being the presence of hope to the one who doesn't have the strength to carry on. We co-create with God with every kind word and every gesture. We affirm the resurrection by loving those on the fringes of society. We co-create with God when we as the church stands up for the oppressed. We affirm the resurrection by living in community no matter how different and unique we all are. 
Resurrection reminds us that a new kind of world is bursting forth in the midst of the one we know, and we are invited to take part in this new creation by being co-creators with God. Resurrection tells us that this world matters to God, and God has not given up on us, but instead is renewing, redeeming, and restoring all things back to God's self. Resurrection reminds us that every day is a new day, a new opportunity for new life. Today does not have to be like yesterday because we are made new on a daily basis. The church is an agent of new creation because our every act of service, mercy, and compassion matters. We are a manifestation of the God that we follow, so it is up to us to bring forth the good news of the resurrection and the new creation it brings. Amen.